Okay, very good. But now we move on to physics, and I hand over to Nick as the chairman of this morning. Thank you, Hannah. Okay, so we start off with Alejandro Castro, who's going to tell us about black holes in 3D higher spin gravity. Okay. Um, so. So thank you. Um, I wanted to also thank Joanna for organizing uh, this wonderful conference. I wanted to thank you guys to bear with the heat and be here with me in this room. I hope the black hole is not going to be too hot. Uh, but in any case, so this, the subject of today, I'm going to basically review uh, what is our understanding of black holes and 3D higher spin gravity. Is this, now I feel like I'm very loud. Is this too loud? No, it's okay. <coughs> very good. So the premise of the talk is pretty simple. Like your starting question uh, on this subject is yes, what is a black hole? Okay, it's as simple as that. This is going to be the theme throughout the entire talk. Now you might say, well, that's easy, right? We all know what a black hole is. <laughs> We're all relativists after all. But uh, and let me challenge you a little bit. So okay, so when we say we have a black hole, in the context of general relativity, most of you will be like, oh, okay, we, this is a black hole. It's characterized by its Penrose diagram. That's one way you can have, like as a starting point, what is a black hole? More generally though, when you try to think of this more broadly, uh, there's various features that characterize black holes. You can say, Right, that a black hole is something that is characterized by having an event horizon. Maybe you can say a black hole is something characterized by a singularity. Uh, you can say, no, actually, the more fundamental aspect of a black hole is the fact that it's a thermodynamic object. It carries huge amount of entropy. You could also say more now in a, in, in a detection era, no, actually, a black hole is something that is characterized by its quasi-normal mode spectrum. This is how we actually establish that a solution is a black hole. Or uh, in, a, in this holographic setup, you can say, no, a black hole is something that is characterized by its quantum information properties, by its entanglement structure. That's how I'm going to decide that something is a black hole. Now, in the context of general relativity, the, all of these things are implied. Um, and so kind of picking through this list of properties of features of black holes is not really well, we, we wouldn't kind of disagree because we'd say if you start with the first one, then you'll go through the rest of them, right? Now, the point is that uh, not every theory of gravity is actually a geometrical theory or has a classical geometrical description. And so this is why you kind of have to go through this list and question what of this type of features, or even more here, I should say I'm only kind of you could add more things to this list of what you think a black hole should be. Uh, but in a theory that where I don't have a geometrical description, such as higher spin gravity, it's not clear which of these features should be your starting point. And it's also not clear that if I start with one of such definitions, it will imply the rest, okay? So one of the reasons why many people have been interested in higher spin gravity, there's there's many reasons why you might be interested, but one of them is because it challenges these notions, these natural notions that we associate uh, to general relativity. So throughout this talk, we're going to explore this question. We're going to explore this, these definitions. And my goal is to give you a definition of what a black hole is uh, without having any type of geometric description, okay? So I'm trying to, we're going to try to abstract this notion of what a black hole is, and I want to uh, do it in such a way that is compatible with the gauge symmetries that defines a higher spin theory, okay? So this is, this is the goal, and I hope I'll convince you that we have achieved something along those lines. Now, along the way, um, we're going to be in a holographic setup, uh, we're going to challenge the holographic dictionary. By that, I mean, I'm not going to find any contradictions or anything like that, but we're going to put it to a test. So I'm going to use the dual theory to help me try to decide what is or what is not a black hole uh, and how things are interconnected. Uh, and as well, uh, as we'll see, 
will be challenging a lot this intuition that we tend to take for granted when we're just studying general relativity. Okay? So, very good. So, with that in mind, the outline for the talk is as follows. Um, I'm going to first tell you a bit about this theories of higher spin, the specific type of theories uh, that we've been studying. And then we're going to go through three different aspects of black holes. We'll study Euclidean black holes. Uh, we'll talk about as well extremal black holes in the context of higher spin gravity. And at the end, um, sorry, I feel like the beep doesn't bother you. It does? Me too. Okay. Sorry, I'll try to speak that way. Um, and then um, if I have time, well, if I don't have time, I might skip number three and go to number four. So I'll try to keep a, an eye on the clock. Uh, but uh, then we're going to explore the concept of what is an eternal black hole and start asking, uh, in this context, Laurentian questions about locality uh, in, in black hole physics and higher spin uh, gravity, okay? And then we'll finish with some nice thoughts that you can take back home and hopefully work on black holes and higher spin gravity. I'm optimistic. Very good. Uh, this Trin-Simons formulation of higher spin gravity. Now, uh, as a start, this is a very common start, some few words about gravity in three dimensions. As many, many of you know, uh, gravity in three dimensions is a very powerful theory. It's an extremely good toy model uh, of quantum gravity. And one of the features why it has been exploited so much in, in our history uh, is that there's a, there's a very interesting luxury in 3D gravity, just Einstein gravity, and it's that you can formulate it in two different ways. You can cast uh, three-dimensional general relativity in the usual way, how we do it in higher dimensions, using a metric formulation and having the Einstein-Hilbert action as your action principle, or uh, as uh, these people taught us uh, in the 80s, uh, we can also use what's known as a Trinsimus formulation. Okay, so it's, it's a theory where the fundamental variables will be uh, gauge fields, gauge connections. Okay, now each of these formulations has its strengths and it has its weaknesses, okay? So uh, from the metric point of view, what's nice is that it's very similar to how we describe gravity in higher dimensions. Uh, uh, there's local variables, uh, the space-time is explicit. It's a geometrical uh, theory. Now, the Trinsimus formulation has, as well as strengths, um, it, it reflects very clearly, well, it treats gravity as a, as a gauge theory, uh, which is nice because we're supposed to understand gauge theories, or at least, that's what I was taught at some point in my life. Um, but it also makes very explicit that 3D gravity is a topological theory. And when you're in the Trinsimus formulation, that's always like in your face. When the metric formulation, well, it's, all, it's also there. Like it's not, it's not that it's not there, but uh, the Trinsimus formulation makes it very, very explicit. Now, my focus will be on this type of formulation. And one of the reasons is because if I use this formulation, it's very easy to generalize it, to kind of expand the theory, not just to a theory of gravity, but to include higher spin modes, okay? So this will be extremely, extremely straightforward. You can also, as well, uh, not just talk about higher spin theories in this context using this Trinsimus formulation. You could also, as well, talk about uh, non-relativistic theories as well. It makes it, this language makes it quite convenient. Uh, but today I'm going to uh, focus on this higher spin uh, type formulation. So, okay, so how do we describe this theory? So, uh, the Trinsimus theory is described by this action, okay, so it's a trace of A which uh, dA, um, but if you just write this action, you're not quite done. You have to do a bit more to kind of claim that uh, this is a theory of gravity, okay? So, not just writing Trinsimus kind of gets you out of the loop, uh, there's a little bit more, and there's at least uh, two important uh, inputs as you try to manipulate this theory as a theory of gravity. Uh, the first one is that you need to tell me what is the gauge group, okay? So uh, you specify for me what the gauge group is. That's going to tell me something about the content of the theory. And in particular, uh, we're very fond of picking gauge groups, which are actually the product of two of them. 
And um, the way we organize the modes is that within this bigger gauge group, we identify the subgroup that will correspond to the graviton. So now, from now on, every time you see SL2 times SL2, you think, oh, that's just uh, the Einstein part, if you wish, like that's a graviton mode. And then you organize the rest of the, um, the generators of the group relative to this subgroup. And that's how you identify what are the remaining modes that you have, and, they, and you identify them as being of higher spin. So this is one input, okay? So what will be like the matter content of your theory? The second input is boundary conditions, and this is crucial. So, um, and this is really at the core of what makes this theory gravitational. So you need to have some uh, notion of what it means to be ADS, and what does it mean to be asymptotically ADS in the Trans-Simons formulation. So very systematically, basically you identify one connection as being the ADS connection, and then the boundary conditions are roughly that uh, if you say, oh, what does it mean to be asymptotically ADS? It's kind of like that the difference between the connection that you're interested in and this reference connection is something of order one with respect to a radio, radio variable. So this, for instance, the reason why highlighting this type of uh, condition is important is because one thing that we don't like when we're treating transcendence as a gravity theory is that uh, the connection that is kind of bad is the connection A equal to zero. So that will correspond to uh, a singular type of description, but imposing these boundary conditions kind of prevents you from finding solutions that you would have described as pathological, okay? So that's why boundary conditions are really important in, in this context. So very good. So with these two inputs, you, you can do quite a lot. Uh, so for instance, in terms of like how the, the space of solutions organizes itself, it's quite beautiful. So let's say that if you just had, if your gauge group is just this one, so this will be what I will call pure gravity. So when I refer to pure gravity, this is when I have two copies of SL2. Uh, the, the space of solutions will organize with respect to two copies of Verasur algebra. So this is reminiscent of the Brown and Hena uh, derivation of the phase space of 3D gravity. Uh, if you make, for instance, a choice that is SLN times SLN, then uh, it's a general, the classical phase space is a bit bigger. Uh, it's called WN algebras. You just have to think of them as kind of like a bigger sort of enhanced version of Vera Soro. So what happens in this case is that this index N just tells you how many uh, higher spin currents you will have from starting from two uh, up to N. And then this is a, it's an algebra that contains all of these currents. Okay, so it contains N uh, currents. Uh, there's also a case where you can have infinite number of higher spin fields, which will resemble much more what happens in Basilev's theory of higher spin gravity. Uh, the gauge group here, then it's called HS lambda. You can think of it as an analytic continuation of SLN, where N becomes a real parameter. Um, and then the algebra is what it's called uh, W infinity. Now, um, and well, and all of these algebras are characterized by having a, a central extension, and the central charge is given by, um, well, in the Trans-Simons formulation, is given by six times k, where k was the level of the Trans-Simons theory, so this coupling up here, and if you will, would write it back in like the Einstein-Hilbert notation, you would have said, oh, it's the ADS radius uh, and Planck uh, units, okay? Very good. So the strategy that we're going to take is that we're going to work with this Trans-Simons formulation. We're going to only focus on this. Uh, most, 99% of what I'm going to say is going to be based on this SLN um, higher spin theories. And I'll say a little bit about their supersymmetric uh, counterparts. Uh, so I'll always be treating with a finite number of higher spin fields, but there are results as well that generalize when you have an infinite tower of them. I'm going to exploit holography, so I, when possible, I'll, I'll make comparisons with this theory that has as its algebra this WN symmetry. And one thing that I want to highlight is that I'm never, ever, 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 ever going to involve the metric in this discussion. Okay? Is that clear? Yeah, I saw some notice. Okay, so it's clear. Very good. So that's my strategy. 
Okay, so now let's ta start talking about black holes. We're all now experts in trans-Simon theory with its gravitational interpretation. Very good, great. So, uh, so okay, so right, this is the theory. I'm going to pick uh, these trans-Simon theories such that they look as a copy, like the gauge group is as two copies of SLN, so there will be, I can then split the connection uh, basically in two, and so I will have two trans-Simon terms. Uh, the solutions are quite easy to write down. Um, here they are. So one thing that uh, people like to do right away uh, is that the solutions of the theories can be written in a way where you gauge away the radial part. So here, this is like the radial direction that you will have for the connection. Set will be the coordinate that will describe uh, the boundary theory. And in this Trans-Simons formulation, you kind of, you can very easily like split kind of the two parts. So there's a function here, B of rho, that looks like a, a gauge transformation. And then there's this little connection A that kind of, it feels like it lives just on this uh, set plane. Okay, so this is how we characterize uh, the solutions. It's very convenient, it's very efficient. Um, but now uh, let's talk a bit about then the physics contents that is inside of the solution. So uh, most of the physics contents is just little inside of this little A. So this A will live on this plane here and it will have, uh, it's, a, it's a one form with like two components and each of those components has a physical meaning. Uh, basically, the spatial part of the connection, uh, think of it as the part that contains information about the charges, about the conserved charges that the solution will have. And the time component of this connection, think of it as adding sources, okay? So that's how we sort of understand um, the, the content of a, of a connection in a very rudimentary uh, way. So from the perspective of the CFT, if I have a connection that has these two components, one way how to think about it is basically that I have a theory that has a Hamiltonian, and when I add sources, I'm basically adding these terms uh, to the Hamiltonian of the theory, okay? So I'm turning on some source, and then there's a VEV uh, for the source, appropriate uh, source, okay? So depending on how many sources you want to turn on, which spin uh, field you want to turn on, you have this uh, structure, okay? Very good, so let's see an example, just so that this is a little bit more, more concrete. So n equal three is our favorite example, so it takes us away from the pure gravity case. Uh, and this is how the connection will look like, this A phi. Okay, so uh, this entries one and one here uh, are basically the aspect that tells me that this is asymptotically ADS. So my boundary conditions are encoded on this part of this matrix uh, that tells me, oh, one and one means this is asymptotically ADS. And then the other entry, entries in this matrix will tell me which currents I have uh, turned on. So this curly L will be the fact that I have a spin two current, if you want the energy momentum tensor of the theory. And this parameter W will mean that you have a VEB for a spin three current, okay? So this is how we uh, organize the part of the connection that contains the charges. And if you, if you just have this part of the connection, let's say you don't have the sources, then from here you will be able to derive the algebra for these charges and find that it's a W3 algebra, okay? And the, this construction, of course, is compatible with equations of motions and is satisfying my boundary conditions. Now, the other part of the connection, so now I want to turn on sources. Um, to be honest, it's AT plus A phi that contains the information about the sources. And the way that you uh, figure out what the shape of this, of the remaining part of the, of the connection is, is by imposing the equations of motion. So in this case, uh, the equations of motions just tell you that uh, the two components of the connection have to commute. Uh, but what, what I need you to remember from this is that, okay, so the, the form inside here is dictated by the equations of motions, but then there's a free parameter in front of that connection, and that's basically the source for the spin three current. Uh, there's as well a source for the spin two current, what you will call roughly the temperature. Uh, that you can also put explicitly inside of the connection, but uh, it's more convenient to just hide the source for the spin two current uh, and the periodicity of your set coordinate, okay? So this, the source for the uh, stress tensor is, ki is hiding in the periodicity of set. But you can also, by a reparameterization of, uh, of the boundary, it can 
make it explicit inside of the connection as, a, as an extra source, but okay. Uh, for Mu, you can't do that, so you always have to put it in the connection. So okay, so this is how the connections uh, look like. Now, I'm in, oh, and one thing, sorry, um, that I wanted to highlight is that uh, this identification as well, the reason why we know that this is the right source and, and tau as well, and why we call this a spin two and a spin three is because one thing that you can check based on um, on the equations of motions that uh, the, basically the equations of motions and transcendence will lead to the word identities in the CFT. So this is why this notation is, is the one that I'm using, okay? The identification of the parameters are in this way because uh, it will lead to the appropriate uh, word identities. Very good. So what I have right now from the point of view of the bulk, uh, so I had this radial direction and I had an identification along uh, this Complex, complex set direction. So from the point of view of 3D gravity, it means that the topology that I'm discussing is the topology of a solid uh, torus. So there's two ways I tend to like to depict them, just explicitly like as a solid torus. Or sometimes I like to also think of like, oh, I have a, I'm basically here on this side of the picture, I'm freezing the angular part and I'm viewing like the radial direction on this side and then the time direction has been uh, identified along this direction. So it would, this will look like the cigar type uh, geometry. But in, in any case, either of these two pictures that you feel more comfortable with, uh, this is the topology that, that we have uh, as we turn on these sources, okay? It's a topology of a solid torus. Now, the connections live on top of this topology. And the basic uh, punchline is that they should support the, basically the cycles that you have in this topology. So there's two cycles. So this picture illustrates them clearly. There's a cycle around the phi direction. So phi is periodic with periodicity two pi. And then there's another cycle that is the periodicity of the Euclidean time, roughly speaking, which is this cycle over here, which I can contract. So this picture makes it very clear that there's one cycle that is contractible, that it goes to a smooth kind of point, and it's this Euclidean time cycle, and then there's the other cycle, the phi one. Okay, so the connection has to be compatible uh, with this uh, structure. Now, as Michael and, and Per taught us, well, that actually will impose conditions on, on the connections, and in particular, it will tell me that if I compute the holonomy of the connection along that cycle that is shrinking, and that I can shrink to zero freely, uh, then the holonomy of the connection along that cycle should be trivial. Okay? And this is it. <laughs> so, uh, if, if you give me a connection, and even if you solve the equations of motions, you're not quite done. You have to make sure that that connection is compatible with the topology that you have. So we have to impose that the holonomy uh, is trivial along that cycle. Now let's rewrite that a little bit. So I told you the connection, you can gauge away the radial part. So then this holonomy is a path ordered exponential, but actually it turns out to be the path order exponential of only this little a. And by trivial, uh, what I mean is that uh, the holonomy of this connection has to belong to the center of the group. That's what this element L0 is one of the cartans uh, of, the, of the algebra, and, and this is one of its centers. And so then uh, basically means that the path order exponential of this little a has to belong to the center. And you can uh, further kind of decompose this equation a bit. And it turns out to be nothing more than just an eigenvalue equation. So you give me a connection that it had little, that had legs along set and set bar, and that you will enforce this trivial condition will tell you that this combination, the eigenvalues, of this matrix have to be equal to the eigenvalues of that element of the Cartan. And that's uh, your smoothness condition. Now, the thing that is very nice about this, this condition is that I'm only using Trans-Simons formulation and it's completely gauge invariant way how to characterize when a connection is smooth, okay? So a very natural condition, a necessary condition, if you wish, in this Trans-Simons <laughs> language. I should hurry up a bit. Um, now, the thing that is quite remarkable about this definition is that it gives us something for free. So first of all, it's a condition. 
So the, the connection dependent on this L, on like the, the web of the energy momentum tensor, dependent on some currents. It also depended on what I was calling tau and mu, my sources. And imposing this restriction uh, gives you a condition on them. So here I wrote them implicitly. For instance, it will tell you how tau and mu uh, are as a function of L and J, okay? Uh, what's remarkable is that if you combine this with the Trans Simons uh, variational principle, uh, you will find first law of thermodynamics. So this equation basically implies this relationship, okay? There's a first law. And the entropy that you would identify in this first law is given by this very elegant formula, which is just dictated by the eigenvalues of the spatial part uh, of the connection. Isn't that great? <laughs> you guys don't care. Okay, that's fine. Um, but this is quite remarkable. This is really, really, really uh, a beautiful relationship between how you go from a, uh, a regularity condition in the Trans-Simons formulation to a quite intricate uh, thermodynamic uh, relationship uh, with a very uh, beautiful formula for the entropy. So what have we done? What have we learned so far by studying this Euclidean black hole? We basically uh, imposed a regularity condition, a Euclidean regularity condition on the connections, and what we got for free was the uh, thermodynamics of the uh, system. Since it's a system with a large amount of entropy, you're very tempted to say, well, this whole game that you were playing, it kind of looks like a black hole, right? So where I'm getting very similar relationships as I will get in normal black hole physics. So, and in normal black hole physics, I also would have imposed a regularity condition on the cigar geometry. So from this Euclidean perspective, it feels like this, this uh, trivial holonomy condition actually leads to a good definition of what a Euclidean black hole would be, okay? Very good. Our point so far, I don't know. But this is one uh, interesting remark. Very good. So now let's uh, explore other aspects of black holes. So that, that was the Euclidean part uh, of, of the story. There's other types of black holes that we know of. In particular, black holes that we like very, more, very much are extremal black holes and supersymmetric black holes. So how does the game go in that context? So this is based on a paper uh, from 2015 uh, with this set of authors. So in this context, Again, you have to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, what is an extremal black hole? How do you define an extremal black hole? I have all these definitions of what you would have, you would have called an extremal black hole. You could have said, well, an extremal black hole is when you have multiple horizons and they coincide. Great. Or you could have said, well, no, an extremal black hole is characterized by the fact that it has zero Hawking temperature. Maybe since I was starting from a thermodynamic point of view, you would have said, well, that should be your definition of extremal black hole, zero temperature. You could have said, no, no, actually, an extremal black hole is something where uh, you have enhancements of symmetries near the horizons. So you get this ADS2 factor in the near horizon geometry. Or you could have said, no, an extremal black hole is something that saturates cosmic censorship. So to avoid naked singularities, for instance, in the usual cases, like the mass has to be bigger than the angular and you can have said, oh, the extremal black hole is what saturates that bound. That's what defines the extremal black hole. Or you could have said, well, there's some set of BPS conditions. If you're very supersymmetric oriented, you would have said it saturates BPS conditions. Well, this is actually the worst of the starting points, but, well, you might have taken that starting point. Or you could have said, no, actually, the way that you find extremal black holes is by imposing that your observables are real. For instance, that the entropy doesn't have an imaginary contribution. And so the entropy always has to be real. And so when you get to that saturation, if the entropy wants to start getting imaginary, then that defines extremality. Again, in GR, <laughs> these are all the same things. But now let's explore if all of these things are, are actually, can we implement a definition where you would gain all of these aspects of extremal black holes all at once? Okay, so um, let's go back again to how our solutions look like. So basically what I want to highlight, what we learned from the Euclidean black hole uh, story, is that uh, a lot of the physics from the thermodynamics point of view, is just controlled uh, by the eigenvalues uh, of these connections. So either 
Uh, there's a component of the, of the matrix of these connections for which its eigenvalues have to be uh, trivial, and then there's another set of the eigenvalues that uh, dictate what the entropy is. But I, basically what I did so far was just tell you how to reduce the problem of defining black holes as a problem of eigenvalues. Now, when you solve for these conditions, for this condition in particular, uh, this condition actually makes sense if the matrices are diagonalizable. So if I can diagonalize the matrices, this matrix is, is diagonal, then it makes sense to impose this type of condition. And so this led us very naturally to say, well, maybe the way I should think about extremality is the fact that uh, this component of A5, so one of these connections actually, is not diagonalizable, okay? So if the, all the charges are independent, then I can diagonalize the matrix, but maybe if there's a relationship between the charges, then the non-diagonalizability will tell me that I have some type of uh, saturation. So that was our starting point. Non-diagonalizable in this context, think of it as confluence of eigenvalues, so eigenvalues are repeating. And if you, with the thing that is very nice from the starting point is that if you impose this condition, then via this holonomy uh, equation, it will tell you immediately that you're going to get zero temperature. So as you enforce that this guy is non-diagonalizable, since equations of motions will relate it to this other part of the connection, it will force uh, the temperature to go to zero. So that's a, this is kind of nice. So we get uh, two for one again. So from this general relativity perspective, uh, what we did is say, well, an extremal black hole should be a confluence of eigenvalues, having repeated eigenvalues in this matrix. This immediately will tell us that I have zero uh, Hawking temperature. That's great. Um, but the rest of the conditions are still a bit uh, murky. So uh, a different set uh, of authors, for instance, decided to, to impose this last condition as your condition of extremality, of how you saturate uh, a bound. So by saying that the imaginary part uh, of the entropy had to be zero. Now, in very, for very specific values of n, basically two different values of n, n equal three, uh, and, a, and a version of n equal four, uh, these, um, these two approaches are equivalent. They will give you the same uh, conditions on when do you reach extremality. So imposing that the uh, entropy doesn't have an imaginary part will imply that the Hawking temperature is zero, but to be quite honest, one, one thing that is not known is that this, if it, this is always true. So something that you can study further is try to really understand how these other uh, parts are interconnected. Particularly this one, uh, I have evidence again for n equal three that the third uh, property is true, but I don't have evidence generically for any value of n that I'll see an enhancement that is similar to this ADS2 enhancement. So let me, let's, sorry, so let me now for, for, to show you why this is not obvious and, and why not all of these properties are, are interconnected. Uh, let's look at this one, this one that I, I wasn't very excited about, the supersymmetric one. So let's say that I, uh, we, we did this exercise of like saying, okay, let's look at how these black holes behave uh, when the gauge group is supersymmetric. And let's study the conditions for supersymmetry, the BPS equations of the system and understand how they're related uh, to the physics, to these extremal conditions. And so you can find the BPS bounds. Uh, that's understanding if a connection is compatible with supersymmetry uh, is straightforward. It's basically finding if there's gauge transformations with fermionic generators on, it, on them. I won't make you go through the details. I'll just tell you that uh, we did this exercise. We picked a supersymmetric version of Trinsimons we found the BPS bounds both on the CFT and on the gravity side independently. We did both computations separately. They match in the large C limit, okay? So there's agreement. Uh, but something uh, that was very strange, and that's why I'm not, it's not clear that all of these definitions are compatible with each other in higher spin gravity, is that one of these BPS bounds, uh, when we translated them to the bulk and built the appropriate black hole in the bulk, that was compatible with one of these BPS bounds gave us a black hole that was at finite temperature. So we found in higher spin gravity a supersymmetric black hole at finite temperature. That's not okay. So there, there are some um, 
features of this example that I'm happy to discuss with you later if you're interested in this little uh, puzzles that we encounter, but this is just to reflect that in these theories, uh, there's so much rich structure that it's not obvious that everything will imply everything else in the same uh, way. Okay? But well, you're all very comfortable with having supersymmetric black holes at finite temperatures, so I'll carry on. Last point. <laughs> You can have uh, fine, okay, because usually the, the statement is that if you have um, supersymmetry, uh, you need to have, uh, well, and you, and you have a cycle that is contractible in the bulk. Like, I'm basically using Witten's argument to say why you should have uh, zero temperature with. Okay, I will be happy to, I, I ask, at the time that we were writing this paper, I ask and I ask and people just look at me like I was a crackpot person. So if you, if, I'll be really happy to, to discuss this with you because I was very confused and nobody really resolved my problem. But okay. Um, let's now talk about eternal black holes. Okay, so this is the most, more challenging part uh, of this whole task. Uh, it's based, it, it all started with, with Martin, who's here in the audience, and, and Nabil Iqbal in 2013, and, and there's some progress that we've done since then, uh, with as well my PhD student, uh, Eva Yavres, who's going to be a postdoc at Saclay uh, next year. So, this was the picture, the first picture that I showed you about a black hole uh, was this one, right? And so ideally, uh, as, we, as we go through this exercise of like defining like how could a black hole be, what is its features, how to, how to characterize it, like the holy grail is at the end of the day in this higher spin gravity is to actually build this. Like tell me, tell me what are the causal properties of the solution. You give me a pair of connections. What, are, what is the causality features that I have here? What are the local properties? And what does it mean to have like some form of Penrose diagram in, in this theory? Um, and so this is, this is basically what we're trying to do, okay? This is, this is our goal. And to start, just for the purpose of this talk, let's think of this first in the CFT language, okay? Let's just kind of establish what would be an eternal black hole if you're a holographer. Okay, so if you're a holographer, uh, you read one of Maldacena's papers uh, right after ADS-CFT, and what did he tell you? Okay. <laughs> well, that an eternal black hole should be a thermal field double state, okay? That was his proposal, yeah? You have an eternal black hole, it's a thermal field double state, okay? And the thermal field double state has very specific uh, features, and so if you want to say that you have an eternal black hole, it better, um, of this form. So let's say that I take his proposal and I take that seriously. Whereas in the Euclidean picture, like what we were doing was saying, well, the Euclidean black hole is something that has a high amount uh, of entropy. But let's, let's take this picture here and say an eternal black hole is something that should be dual to the thermal field double state. Okay, so how would I test this proposal? So uh, how do I implement uh, these definitions? So here, this will be the thermal field double state that I would have uh, in the CFT. And basically, uh, it means that uh, in order to, to signal one of the, the things, like as a minimal type of requirement, what would I ask uh, out of this definition, is that uh, as I compute correlation functions, it will mean basically, okay, that I have two boundaries, there's two copies, a left and a right copy. Uh, and uh, as I compute correlation functions on this background, either correlation functions that are at each boundary or a correlation function between operators on each of the two sides, there has to be certain periodicity conditions on those uh, correlation uh, functions, okay? So this is basically what I need. Like here I wrote them down, so if I compute a correlation function uh, the, on the CFT on the background, of this thermal field double state, um, I should obey these type of relationships, okay? I'll very loosely call them uh, KMS type conditions, even though only one of them is the historically KMS conditions. But uh, you should see basically that it's periodic in, in Euclidean time and, and, and it's, there's this reflection between left and right and then 
uh, there's this half period over here in this last relationship, okay? Now, um, in this Trans-Simons theories that we had, uh, it basically implied, oh, you have to compute correlation functions, and you would do this computation on the background for that connection. So the first attempt uh, to do this was done by Pear and, and Eric, uh, and actually in the context of full Vassilia theory, because when you do, uh, when you look at the full Vassilia theory, there's a scalar field in that theory, and so that allows them to compute uh, correlation functions in that context. But now I'm obsessed with this SLN theories, where I don't do I carry out these set of computations. So to do that, basically, uh, I need to understand uh, what replaces the notion of distance in higher spin gravity. How do I probe the theory locally? What does it mean to have uh, uh, local fields uh, in this context? And the solution is uh, not that strange. Um, the way a, a natural probe that exists in Trans-Simons theory is it's a Wilson line, in particular the endpoints. Uh, of a Wilson line. So the thing that I'll, uh, I'll focus on and, and, and try to understand this, uh, this local physics is by understanding this object, okay? So it will be the path order exponential of the two connections I have. I'm going to consider an open uh, Wilson line, okay? So it has an endpoint xi and xf along whatever curve you want. And, uh, and there's states that I'm projecting at the endpoints of those curves. So the states here live on the representation that I picked to compute uh, this given uh, Wilson line. Now, uh, this object has a lot of structure, uh, has a lot of features, and I think Per is going to talk about this a bit more if I, yes, maybe, no, okay. No, he's not going to talk about this, okay, fine. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, just a very, very basic highlight uh, of this object. Um, so here the representation R, the reason why uh, it's very natural to think of this object as something that, that will serve as a local probe is because uh, the, by manipulating this representation, it's basically a, a way how to introduce um, a probe that will have some given mass and spin. So the, the data of the representation will tell you what is the mass and what is the spin of the probe that, uh, that you're using. Uh, the other need, uh, nice feature about this is that if you have been attentive so far, uh, in most of the talk, I've only been talking about one of the connections. Every time, I, when I gave you the definition of the Euclidean black hole, when I gave you the definition of the extremal black hole, I didn't use both connections at the same time. I, I was just focusing on one of them because there were like these two copies of, of SLN and I, and I just was kind of imposing conditions on one of them. This is a, uh, an object that, uh, will connect both. And this is what we expect if I actually want to kind of have this local description, this causal description. It should be an observable that interconnects uh, both uh, connections. And in particular, the states U, uh, this also, if we want these two connections to communicate and to rebuild this, this picture, uh, this state U cannot be just any state in the representation that you pick. Uh, one thing that uh, we tried to make as clear as possible is that these states you have to be uh, coherent states that will mix suitably the, the observable, the, the two connections here. And this is basically because what I, what I did remember from, from, from normal Einstein-Hilbert uh, gravity is that Einstein-Hilbert gravity is not a factorizable theory. So as I build these observables, the observables should not not every observable that I, I build should factorize because quantum gravity does not factorize. Uh, and so this is one type of observable that will tell me how it actually, how the connections uh, communicate. So very good. So we can do, uh, we can evaluate this object. We have done it extremely explicitly. Uh, and just to tell you some of the computations that we've done, uh, you can put the endpoints of the Wilson line at the boundary of ADS. Uh, if you do that, then uh, one can show very explicitly that what this Wilson line is doing is computing the correlation function of, of two operators uh, on the background of some heavy state. So this state psi here will represent uh, basically which background connection you put. So if you did the computation on global ADS, the state will be like the vacuum. If you did the computation on a black hole background, this will be like a thermal state that you're putting uh, here. Okay. So it computes uh, boundary correlation functions. 
this was very nice. Uh, if you p pick a closed loop, so you don't heat the entropy. So that's also very satisfactory. So if I, if I uh, pick the cycle, uh, that will correspond. Um, so OK, so now with this, basically, I have a definition of how to compute boundary uh, correlators. Uh, we can uh, basically do this computation, compute this type of correlators, compute correlators that go from one side to the other, and, and on the left side as well. Now, this, the interesting thing about this computation, in particular the one that goes from one side uh, to the other, or when you compare both sides, is that the other thing that I've been neglecting, because I told you who cares, uh, now this function is going to be important, this radial function. So before as well, in all of our definitions of black holes, I didn't even tell you what that function v of rho was. I, and nobody asked, so I didn't tell you what it was. Uh, and it was because uh, prior to that, uh, all the Euclidean definitions and this extremal definitions just made use of this little a. But actually now, as I try to explore uh, the bulk, now I actually care about what that b of rho actually is. And there's different choices that you can make. So as we try to understand, OK, I will compute these correlation functions. Will these properties be satisfied? Uh, there's three different uh, gauges that, that we pick, basically three different choices. A nomenclature that um, uh, Michael, Pear, and Martin, and Eric uh, implemented. Uh, uh, if, and this is the gauge that most of the people use when they actually specify what this function is. This is the most commonly used one. If you use this gauge, uh, these relationships don't hold. You don't find the KMS conditions. So they are, the gauge is nice because it gives you something that is asymptotically ADS on one side. Uh, but you would say from there, if you say, no, this is my definition of my connection, it, it, it doesn't obey the KMS conditions. Yeah, but the, well, it's an, it has endpoints, so it has to specify boundary conditions at the endpoints. And basically what happens is that you need to tell me how you relate when one endpoint is one on one side versus when the other endpoint is on the other side. And that actually affects uh, these periodicity conditions. So if you use this gauge, <laughs> you're going to infer that this Euclidean black hole that had tons of entropy is not the thermal field double state. OK. Now, there's another gauge uh, that was built in this paper, and then we did, which was called the horizon gauge. And it's because if you insist on having a metric description, uh, you can build a function b of rho that will tell you that you actually have a horizon in that uh, this is not a gauge invariant statement. So, uh, but in any case, you can, you can play this game. Uh, in, that, in that case, uh, KMS does hold. But the connections are not asymptotically, yes. So you can just show that if you, with that profile of the radial function, you will have a periodicity. But they will not compute boundary correlation functions because the boundary gets destroyed by that choice of radial profile. And so then it doesn't work. But OK, not everything is lost. So one thing that we did, we told you how to build something that we call the Kruskal gauge, just in kind of memory of Kruskal coordinates. And there is a choice of radial profile for which both KMS holds, and you will have something that is asymptotically ADS, so everything uh, will be fine. But it's what, what is interesting in this context is that, um, and what I want to illustrate is that, not because I had a good Euclidean definition and all of these thermal properties, it will mean that I will have all remaining properties that I was expecting uh, out of a black hole, in particular this Lorentzian property. Uh, that we tend to like so much and that it's very natural in general relativity. Like, I didn't, you don't have to say anything else. You just say, oh, I have a Euclidean black hole and has a lot of entropy, then, then you will be able to analytically extend it and have this eternal picture and everything is fine. And higher spin gravity, actually, uh, that is not guaranteed. And it depends on how you manipulate this part of the connection. So a way to view this is that this is a way where, like, if you're trying to do bulk reconstruction, try to understand how do you move away from the boundary and explore the interior. Uh, this is a very sensitive and tricky game, and you can get different answers depending on what is the physics that you're trying to, to preserve. So very good. Five minutes.
this is perfect because I'm basically now done. So this is a little uh, taste of what uh, we know about uh, black holes in the context of 3D uh, higher spin gravity. Uh, there's many, many things that I have not said and I have not uh, reviewed. It will take me another hour at least to go through them. So these are things that I didn't discuss, but I do want to highlight because there's a lot of uh, interesting directions to still explore here. So one of them, for instance, is the phase diagrams of these black holes. Uh, so I... I did not highlight, when, when we solve for these holonomy conditions, there's actually more than one solution. And this tells you that you don't just have the typical phase diagram of like thermal ADS versus the black hole. There's actually other solutions um, that solve the holonomy conditions and they compete. Uh, the phase diagrams have been studied quite a lot and one of the authors that knows this well is Ignacio Reyes, who's in the audience somewhere around here, so you can ask him. Uh, and the thing that is open here, which is interesting to explore, is the counterpart in these WM theories. So there's uh, a lot of analysis on the bulk, on how the, the black holes tell you what would be critical points and phase transitions. Uh, but on the WN side, on the CFT side, I think that this has never been studied or explored. So there's, there's something to be said on the other side of the the duality. Uh, I also didn't uh, say much about the statistical interpretation of this entropy, about the partition functions uh, in, the, in the CFT, uh, that I'll say a little bit more on the, on the next slide. And as well, uh, there's more to say about computing correlation functions uh, using uh, these Wilson lines or, or, or other methods, uh, because uh, besides the issue about KMS conditions, there's other aspects of higher spin gravity that go against the law of uh, general relativity. So for instance, one of the things that um, these black holes uh, have differences relative to just your plain vanilla ADS Churchill is that uh, they don't have the same chaos type structure. So they're actually not very good scramblers. Uh, they, they also don't thermalize in the same way. So there's various interesting features of this type of theories that don't obey the usual uh, notions that we have about black holes in other dimensions or in other, in other theories. So to end, uh, I think here I'm just going to highlight uh, three things that uh, are still left to explore. Uh, the first one is related to the CFT counterpart uh, of the entropy derivation. So on the bulk, there was this very elegant form of entropy, uh, the high energy, uh, density of states in a theory with WN symmetry should have this very simple and elegant formula in terms of this eigenvalues. Uh, there's no such derivation in WN theories of a formula like this. It's only been done perturbative, perturbatively uh, as a function of the sources, but not as an exact f uh, formula for any value uh, of, of the source. So this will be the analogous of like the Cardi derivation um, for just the Verasoro case. What is the derivation when you have this WN symmetry? Uh, there's a much more to uh, explore in the interplay between Euclidean and Laurentian black holes. So what I focus on, uh, and we did in the past, was just kind of explore the existence of the other boundary and what were the conditions on the connection such that I would get to the other boundary. But there's also inner horizons, if I have rotation. Uh, uh, there's singularities, uh, kind of like what happens as I go up in the Penrose diagram, what are other aspects, how do you detect these things in Trans-Simons theory that has not been studied. And then uh, last uh, but not least, I think something that is very interesting now is that uh, because we were thinking of higher spin gravity and in terms of this Wilson line, uh, it, it kind of very naturally brought us to the subject of both group construction and gravitational dressing and trying to understand how to set up the computation of this gravitational uh, Wilson line and start exploring basically uh, local uh, bulk physics and, and what is the meaning from the CFT. So as you, as you have some definition on the boundary, how do you move that definition on the boundary into the bulk via a type of operation of this way? So now we basically have all the ingredients to explore this a bit more, and this is uh, the content of one of the last papers that we wrote on this subject. So with that, thank you very much.
Sorry, I, should I point? Oh. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, in terms of your uh, your checklist in the beginning of the talk, um, I'm wondering how about number three? So, quasi-normal modes. I guess it would be natural to study them as poles. As, you know, the natural requirement would be poles in the retarded Green's function. Is that something? that yeah, people can do in the so, chain Simons formulation? Uh, we haven't worked that out yet because to study quasi-normal mode, you need to study perturbations <coughs> on top of the, like. But you can also demand uh, poles in the retarded Green's function. Yeah, but I need to compute a Green's function. <laughs> you can do that on the, on the CSP side. Too. Right, 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 but I need to do it on the, on the bulk side as well. So that's why now, now we're getting geared up to do that type of computation, to study the linear response of the, of the black hole, but for that I need to know how to probe it. That's, a, that, that was, that's part of the th reason why it's not automatic. So if I don't have a probe, um, it's, it's a bit difficult. Like the one way, um, yeah, there's another way that you could have that. No, let me leave it at, at that. Uh, now we can do it because now I have a way how to probe the the, the theory, so using this Wilson line basically, that it's basically acting, the endpoints of the Wilson line is basically acting as a local field. Uh, now I have a consistent way how to like couple some matter to the solution. And, and then from there I can tell you, yes, I'll compute, for instance, uh, a bulk to boundary propagator, uh, look at that, the retarded Green's functions and look at what the poles are. But before that we didn't, like yeah, so, so this is something that is, that, that's why these Laurentian questions are quite interesting and they're not, Obviously, the same as the as the Euclidean, like in the Euclidean context, that you, you were not like the language is very different. So, so yeah. So that's why I have no. The, and there's all these like aspects of black holes that it's really fascinating to try to understand how they're how they're tied to each other. And yeah, quasi normal modes is something that has not yet been uh, fully <coughs> understood or not understood. Yeah. Oh, I think there was some. But also, yeah. Yeah, I'm a bit confused about uh, the fact that the uh, in extreme black holes the entropy is real. Uh, how could it ever ha happen that the entropy is in it is an area becomes imaginary? Well, it, just think of it like it's basically a cosmic censorship. So even for like the even for like the Rice and Ostrom solution, let's say in four dimensions. Uh, if the charge is bigger than the mass, then in the, in the area law, you will ha basically the area becomes complex. That's, that's what would happen if you take that formula face value. So, so if you look at the, at, uh, at, in, in any, for, for any black hole, um, yeah, uh, basically the, what it guarantees for you that the, the size of the horizon is a real parameter is the cosmic censorship uh, bound. And so uh, if the, if the, if you violate cosmic censorship, then the size of the horizon will become, will have an imaginary component to it, and then the area <laughs> would have an imaginary piece. So, so that's the analog of, of that relationship. So it happens in GR as well. I think that was your question or not? Yeah. Uh, oh, where? Did you have a question? I think Andreas had a, or? Yeah, Andreas. Or? I have two questions about this too. So the one is just clarifying what was just asked. When you say the imaginary part is zero of the entropy, you mean it's sort of, it, it, the imaginary part is zero even at finite temperature, right? But it's sort of the limit when the imaginary yeah, part just is like, about to turn on? Yeah, so, so requiring that the imaginary part is zero gives you an inequality. It tells you all oh, the charges have to be greater or equal than. Right, one. so it's the last value for which the imaginary part is yeah. zero. And then also you had this connection between BPSness and extremality. That's already not true in ADS5, right? The no, no, it's not true in any, like, so that's why I was saying it's a bad starting point because we know, like, even in, in V equal four supergravity, like, Rice and Nostrum depends on how you embed it inside of supergravity, if it's going to be BPS or not BPS. There's embeddings that are BPS and there's embeddings that are non-BPS, even if the solution is extremal. But I was just like kind of, one thing, 
So one thing that the reason why I brought this up is because usually it goes in one direction. If it is DPS, it's then it is okay, You had the opposite years is DPS, but, but not even zero temperature. Exactly. Okay. So, so that's why we explore that question. We said like, oh, would BPS in this context always imply extremality, uh, or or not? And so, so it was that approach. But of course, there's many many extremal black holes that are not DPS. So it, it, it's it's just kind of probing like what implies what and how they're interconnected in that way. Um, this issue with the with the KMS condition uh, not being gauge dependent in some sense is that just does that also happen for pure gravity or is it for higher speed? For it, well, I could in, in the BTC black hole, let's say, yeah. uh, I could pick a, a bad radial profile. <laughs> Um, that will tamper with a KMS condition, uh, but then the, so so you mean like in the Chern-Simons formulation by itself, right? Yeah. So I, I could be Machiavellic and just pick a horrible like radial profile for the BTC and then just spoil uh, this this condition. But then like what people do, and that's that's how this wormhole gauge was picked. Mm -hmm. It was picked like by saying, let's start with the BTC. What is the radial function for the BTC? And then let's just use that forever and ever <laughs> for okay. any higher spin black hole. That was the philosophy at that time. And that's why 99% of the people use it. Uh, but there was no, like, well, there's a little bit of motivation because it's very natural in relationship with asymptotically ADS uh, mm -hmm. boundary conditions. But I could pick a radial profile for the BTC that will give me something horrendous. And so, so the difference. The difference for the BTZ is since you know what the bulk actually is, it's more natural. Yeah, it's more natural. So, the, the, like, why would you fiddle with that? Like, it's kind of, yeah. But uh, from this, from the higher spin block mm -hmm. hole perspective, it really made us think, like, why are we picking that function? Like, uh, what dictates what that function should be, right. and how should okay. we kind of move into the interior as we're exploring like the bifurcation point and exploring the other boundaries? Like, it, it kind of put to the test like that type of philosophy. Yeah. So I will adjust the sound mm -hmm. afterwards.